joining this webinar today. My name is Julia. I'm here on behalf of uh, the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition uh, from Elevate. And I will be at helping uh, to set up the scene for today's webinar before handing it over. So again, this webinar is organized on behalf of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition. I know there's quite a few on the line who are aware of us and a few newcomers. So let us get you all up to speed. In today's webinar, we'll start off with a little bit of an introduction, some housekeeping notes. I'll then hand it over to Jackie and our speakers who will go into the webinar itself. Um, make sure you, if there's any burning questions, you, you hold those to the end, we will have a Q&A session. And to wrap things up today, we'll then let you know of any upcoming events and ways that you can get involved. So just two housekeeping notes here. The first is that these slides will be shared upon request and the webinar itself is being recorded and will be shared at a later time. The second part here to note is that all of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition's meetings and webinars are run in line with Chatham House rules. So what that means for today is we know that some of these issues can be a little bit touchy for some organizations. For asking questions, I uh, would suggest then that you go ahead and type all of your questions into the, um, the GoToWebinar function, and that way we can read it out for you and being able to uh, withhold your identity. So please don't be shy to ask any of your questions. So just a little bit more background now on the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition really quickly. Um, so the coalition is industry members aiming to advance sustainable seafood in Hong Kong through good sourcing practices. It's really about working in a collaborative and practical way to demonstrate good sourcing practices. And we do this by commitment to voluntary codes on responsible seafood sourcing that help you help to empower our members to make sourcing de decisions on their own, you know, bringing it into your own hands and really learning more about your supply chain. The vision of the coalition is for all seafood imported into Hong Kong to be legal, traceable, and of course, biologically sustainable. I have a really quick slide here just to show a current snapshot of some of our members. I'm sure many on the call either are either familiar with these or are already working with some of these members. And I think the emphasis I'd like to have here is really joining the coalition is a, a risk-free way to start improving your seafood supply chain. And for any of those who have not yet met with me about uh, you know, becoming a member, please do reach out. Um, we have confirmed funding for, for the remainder of this year as well as next year. So at the moment, there are no membership fees to joining. So please do get in touch if this is something you'd be interested in. Membership itself is open to any, um, any business in Hong Kong or Macau that is buying or selling seafood. Now with that, let me hand it over to Jackie Dixon, the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition Technical Advisor, who will introduce you to our speakers and, and kick us off for today's webinar. Thanks, Jackie. Brilliant, thanks, Julia. <clears throat> I would like to welcome everyone here today. Thanks so much um, for, for being here um, to talk about social issues in seafood supply chains. So we have a fantastic lineup of two very well-known speakers in this space. Uh, who will be sharing with, with us some of the major concerns facing the people who catch, farm and process our fish in certain parts of the world. Now, before I introduce our speakers to you, I just wanted to set the scene for why this is a risk issue for the seafood industry at large and the global response that we, we've seen. As early as 2001, we saw the US State Department release its annual trafficking in persons report, which is, assesses the risks or efforts of governments around the world on a tiered basis. So this is tiers one to three to combat severe forms of trafficking in persons. So what are governments doing around the world to combat trafficking in human beings? We know that Thailand was downgraded to tier three in 2014, which is the lowest rating possible. Uh, but the country has subsequently improved its rating to tier two due to the efforts being made to eliminate human trafficking. Clearly, this is not unique to Thailand um, alone and other countries also feature on tiers two and three. Then we have the Global Slavery Index emerged in 2013, and this measures the extent of modern slavery country by country on a ranking scale. So countries are ranked out of 167 points 
for the prevalence of forced labor, modern slavery occurring in that population. In the UK, we've seen the Modern Slavery Act come out in 2015. We've seen the Australian Modern Slavery Act uh, come into effect in January 2019. So the regulatory environment is starting to respond. In the case of the UK, the Modern Slavery Act certainly has had an impact and industry has started implementing measures to some degree uh, in order to limit the scope for human rights abuses. We've seen organizations like Seafish in the UK provide online guidance and support tools for how companies can address human rights issues down seafood supply chains. Now, this is happening via their Seafish Ethics Common Language Working Group, a very useful resource of information, including recently published country profiles on these issues. So I do recommend members of HKSSC and others on the call to uh, access that resource via the Seafish Ethics Common Language Working Group, all online. We've seen the release of the vessel certification standard also in the UK called the Responsible Fishing Scheme. Now, this is currently, to my knowledge, the only global standard that audits compliance on board fishing vessels, including ethical and welfare criteria. Then we've seen a flurry of initiatives on the ground in countries like Thailand due to the severity of cases emerging over the years in the Thai fishing industry of slave labor, human trafficking of migrant labor, deceptive practices in recruitment workers, uh, in, re in recruiting workers via you know, scrupulous manning agents, and generally very poor working conditions. So civil society has responded in a big way in Thailand, and we're gonna hear some of, about some of this uh, a little later with Darren's presentation. But these uh, human rights issues are clearly not isolated to one country alone. Problems have emerged in the fishing sector worldwide, even in particularly well-managed fisheries. Um, fishing is also notoriously uh, one of the most dangerous occupations in the world. And risks can range from lacerations, slips, falls, crushing injuries, confined spaces, carbon monoxide poisoning, fire explosions, fatigue, and so forth. So when we start to combine these types of working conditions with the possibilities of illegal fishing operations, one can just imagine how occupational health and safety is not given any priority in such situations. And then on, on shore, fish processing workers can also be exposed to potentially hazardous working conditions. Um, and we have seen um, cases of forced labor practices in the, these areas as well globally. So clearly, this is an emerging risk issue for anyone trading in seafood. Now, the positive outlook is that guidance, tools and strategies um, and approaches are increasingly becoming more available. And who better to learn um, from than the two speakers that we have with us today? Firstly, I would like to introduce you to David Hammond. He is the CEO and founder of Human Rights at Sea. Now, David and his organization are particularly focused on seafarers, migrant workers, and everyone who works in the maritime ecosystem. So he will be sharing with us insights into the research and advocacy work of his organization. Now, when it comes to the global oceans, it often appears that what is out of sight is out of mind. Um, what happens at sea stays at sea. But human rights at sea is making uh, sure that there, this is no longer the case. Um, through its case studies, it's shedding highly needed light on human rights deficits within both the shipping and fishing industries. Um, David is a former English barrister, a military seafarer, and a retired Royal Marines officer. So he's got very practical maritime and legal related experience, having served at sea in the North and South Atlantic, the Mediterranean, uh, the Indian Ocean, Arabian Gulf, and the South China Seas since, his, since he first joined the Royal Navy in 1990. So then our second speaker today is Darian McBain. She's the Global Director for Corporate Affairs and Sustainability at Thai Union. Now, since joining Thai Union in 2015, Darren has taken the company from a commodity focus to a holistic ecosystem approach with a focus on oceans and people. And I would say that Thai Union was very much uh, a victim of the times when it was cornered out five years ago on human rights challenges. And at that time, it was highly profiled as a company and made an example of by Greenpeace. But we know that this is an issue facing the industry at large, and it could have been in all of our supply chains, and it could still be in our supply chains. So what better way than to learn from a company that has faced some of these hardest challenges 
and whose adversaries like Greenpeace have now become some of their greatest allies. Um, so Darren's going to be outlining for us uh, a corporate response to these issues from the high level down to the granular, taking a worker centric approach. She holds a PhD in, in global supply chain analysis from the University of Sydney. She has published numerous academic articles and books and she's managed a consultancy. She's worked at the NHS as well as for the United Nations and WWF. So without any um, further ado, I'm going to pass over to our speakers um, who are going to be presenting um, for around 15 um, minutes each. And then we're going to uh, hand over to the question and answer session at the end. So if you have any questions that come up while they present, please pop this into the chat box, which Julia will be moderating for us. And I'm going to pass over now to David Hammond, who will tell us more about the work of Human Rights at Sea. Thank Thanks, you very David. Much. Firstly, firstly, can you see my uh, my headline slide there? Um, is that up on the screen? Not yet, David. <clears throat> Julia, okay. perhaps you can assist. There we go. Now it's up. Perfect. OK, brilliant. So um, wherever you are in the world, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. and Thank you to the Hong Kong team for the invitation. Uh, I'm also privileged to be speaking alongside Darian um, and uh, I will be looking from a civil society perspective, um, uh, particularly from looking at our work over the last seven years. Um, also importantly, uh, during this uh, time of coronavirus, I hope uh, everybody is safe and well. So very briefly, if you haven't come across human rights at sea, um, we are a independent civil society organization uh, developed in uh, 2014 and we're looking at the issues of transparency and accountability across the entire maritime supply chain. That's for seafarers, fishers, migrants, refugees and also development of business and human rights. We work to SDGs, six of them, and we've been a member of the UN Global Compact since 2015. Our verticals, as I say, include, in this case, the, the fishing and the seafood piece. Uh, and I'm going to go on to some case studies and specifics in due course, which can then lead into Darian's uh, piece. Importantly, we're non-political, uh, we're not religious, we're non-religious and we're not aligned to any specific stakeholder. And so we aim to provide you with a free, yes, a free resource um, for you to dip in and uh, use at any time you need to. Um, and that includes educational materials, but also case studies and publications. Now, our entire structure and indeed the structure of, I suppose, this conversation is one based on our founding principle and our philosophy that human rights apply at sea as they do on land. What do I mean? It means that wherever we are sat in the world listening to this webinar, the rights that we are entitled to fundamentally, particularly under the Universal Declaration 1948, apply to us as much as they do to somebody working offshore Thailand, um, uh, offshore the Falkland Islands, uh, catching the Iliac squid, for example. Um, and it is this major leap in the last seven years that we've seen states at state level uh, come on board with this philosophy. Uh, and last year we assisted with the likes of WWF to change law and policy in 19 countries. Um, you can find us on the web, just type those four words, human rights to see in, and it comes to us. In terms of our scope just last year, a quick uh, image of just our influence. As I say, we are a, an advocacy organisation, but this is our, our coverage. And a lot of that is in relation, particularly in Southeast Asia, to, to fishers. What Sorry, I'd like David. to do... Sorry, can you just let me know? Um, I think the slides aren't advancing on your end. I'm doing it from my end. Can you let me know when to advance? Right, okay, in that case, um, I am on the headline points uh, slide now. Um, okay, great. Got that. So we'll fight through the technical difficulties, Salavi. So um, headline points, uh, if you could uh, just run through those uh, points and put them up, please. Um, firstly, for us, sustainability exists just because of that single factor, the individual. And the individual has lost a lot in relation to business. But of course, businesses exist because of workers. And what we say in our position is very much in our work that those workers um, deserve the full access of all fundamental human rights 
and additional labour rights, remembering that labour rights are a subset of the bigger human rights picture. And as we say, there's no excuses for not protecting the individual because the individual protects the business. So we talk about a key business focus being that it must be on the individual and not should. Um, and that includes the access to effective remedies, internal remedies, external remedies, uh, up, up, including, uh, up to and including lawful remedies, and real transparency in the remediation. And of course, the 2011 UN guiding principles are not hard law, they're guiding principles, but they are the best that we have. We know that a lot of people are working to them as we are. Headline point on transparency. Um, we are really getting away, as, as was mentioned at the start, really since the tip reports coming out in 2001, that you can't hide anymore in this world of this connected world. And particularly when there are responsible NGOs around the world taking a, uh, a view on the business being conducted and whether it's good, bad or ugly and highlighting it. So in short, it's a business enabler to be transparent particularly if you look at the uh, pillar two and pillar three of the UNGPs. Awareness is really key. A lot of people, and I'm told on this call, may not be aware that there are bigger issues happening out at sea. Well, I can assure you there are, um, and these are slowly being exposed. But of course, the fact that the environment out at sea does not lend itself to easy access and its self-transparency is our biggest inhibitor to finding out the ground truth. And as we increasingly talking about the human rights at sea, not our platform, but the concept of human rights, see that ecosystem of philosophy must really uh, focus around one principle. Already highlighted it, what we would like to see is anybody on this call engaging with that principle. And as we're increasingly seeing at state and non-state level, that principle being embedded into businesses philosophy. So I spoke about awareness. Um, awareness comes in many forms. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of the outlaw ocean. Are, are you on that slide now, um, Julia? Yes. Brilliant. So the outlaw ocean, um, uh, and I, <laughs> I'm not plugging the book other than I am plugging the book for the right reasons, is a fantastic read, particularly if you are in any form of lockdown. Um, because what Ian Urbina has done is uh, over his five years of work paralleling a lot of our work, he has really, in his own inimitable style, um, highlighted the abuses occurring at sea. So if you ever wanted a framing document that's easy to read and isn't heavy, isn't a legal text, um, I would certainly start with the Outlaw Ocean. So that then leads us on to the work that we've done, and I put on this slide here of imagery, um, and, and all that is to show you is that there is a lot going on out there. There's a lot of issues being exposed, um, and, and a number of those texts cover not just fisheries, fishermen's welfare, um, issues of abuse and abandonment, um, and also government level work, particularly with the UAE at the top left hand corner. And, and this is what our organisation, alongside many other organisations, do. So the point here is it's available if you want to download it uh, and you want to read it and use it as examples, please do. On to the next slide. Um, I want to now delve into detail because I've been talking really about sort of the higher level piece. Um, we recently uh, were working in Taiwan before the lockdown and um, many of us are aware of both uh, issues in Southeast Asia, um, both in the coastal and deep water fleets. Um, the headlines really for us here is that uh, on the first point that abuse within a, the catching sector, um, not just the farming and the processing, but the catching sector really does affect the entire supply chain, but only if it's known about. So as was um, highlighted in the introduction, that's out, at sea, out of sight, out of mind, really has been the protective veil against abuses, but that is being lifted and that cannot be hidden from uh, anymore. So currently we've been engaging with uh, Taiwanese authorities uh, for the last year in an independent manner. Um, and that really was both NGO and individual requests in country asking 
for us to take a view on what was happening in the coastal and deep water fleets. The third point uh, covers the fact that we, we then didn't just sit as a, doing a desk level review. We went out, we spent time in Taiwan, our uh, field team went and spoke to the likes of Greenpeace, went to their offices um, and, the, and the government, importantly the government, the executive yarn and, um, and also the fisheries agency. Um, and we took a view. Um, we are very happy to say that we had very positive support, um, openness and willingness to engage. And the reason I highlight that is simply because I go back to my transparency point. We can't hide from this if business wants to provide um, a, 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 a perception and indeed highlight that they are doing good business um, uh, and correct business and lawful business. We did, however, uh, however, on that occasion, have limited fishing industry engagement, which we are going to rectify. So in terms of our recent work on the next slide, when we look at Taiwan, we have uh, produced three pieces of work. Again, feel free to download these from our website. Um, and what we do is we don't just say what the issues are. We look at the background, we footnote it, we check all that against the legal text, and then we provide recommendations. So really we do a lot of the hard work for yourselves. But with that recent work, those three images there on that slide, um, the baseline study really was the first look in addition to uh, and taking into account other NGOs work and government work. We then highlight in the middle a specific issue about the power imbalance between employer and worker. And concurrently, we were also looking at exploitative recruitment fees and how that um, comes into the corporate supply chain. Um, and indeed for a business, uh, if you're found to exploit, be exploiting workers, now civil society particularly will pick up on this um, and some will name shame. We will highlight where there, there is the good, the bad and the ugly. The um, indicators um, in relation to uh, the report, and forgive me, that shouldn't be October 2016, it should be 2019. Um, my apologies for that. Our, our, report of, our report of October 2019 um, really touched on a number of the indicators that, that the ILO has highlighted in terms of forced labour. Both the indicators there of involuntariness and indicators of what's termed menace penalty. So on that slide, the highlighted uh, bullet points there we found to a greater or lesser extent did occur in our report. Um, and from that, we then engage with the authorities. So some key points that were highlighted from our work was the treatment of foreign workers, um, and but the need to find uh, and have greater levels of ground truth, greater research, the exploitation of migrant laborers, and um, as we highlighted in that third document uh, or, or research document, the exploitative recruitment practices overseas, uh, and particularly with the recruitment agencies overseas as well. We see this also in the likes of India and elsewhere around the world, but at the moment, just, just focusing on the Taiwanese example, we highlighted the power imbalance um, and, and really ILO 188, um, which came into force on the 16th of November, 2017, um, uh, that's, sorry, uh, yeah, so it's ILO 188 2007, but um, it really came to force uh, in, in 2017. The embedding of 188 into domestic law is utterly key. And uh, unfortunately, really at this stage, we're only looking at 18 states having ratified 188 out of a possible 187. So, as we said, uh, all our publications reports are there and available in the last two bullet points on that slide. So, moving to the next slide, uh, the time and government response. Um, for us, this was very significant. Uh, on the 27th of February, um, we received the formal response from the Fisheries Agency. That actually is on their website as well. But really, the headline point and the recommendation was embedding the philosophy uh, of the state-led narrative of human rights to see on the national agenda. And, and the point here being is that states are responsible for human rights protections um, and, uh, and, and with, well, within the actual state itself. So very much what we are trying to do is 
give away our work, our intellectual property, in order that the states and businesses and seafood uh, buyers and supply chain take up the concept uh, of, of, of a philosophy of human rights to see, as I say, as a philosophy, not as the platform. The platform is just a means to the end. The recommendations for the next slide we're looking very much about the, uh, the government strengthening the international cooperation to learn from other states experiences and therefore extending human rights protections at sea. Now the, the highlighted point at the last sentence is um, the fact that at state level it's been the issue of protecting human rights sea and those four words human rights sea are now increasingly being used. I just want to frame those four words, human rights to see for you, in terms of history. In 2013, uh, when we established the organization, it was triggered by, an in, whilst practicing law, an individual asking what the future was for human rights to see. And, uh, and I did, as everybody will do now, we pick up your phone, you go to your search engine, you type those words in. As a matter of fact, in 2013, outside of academic discussion, there was factually no platform um, advocating for human rights at sea. The reason I say this, and it's, it's quite important to frame it, is that we live in a rules-based environment, generally in world order. So we have disabled rights, child rights, um, women's rights, we even have animal rights. But in 2013, as a matter of fact, nobody was talking in any structured way about human rights at sea which in itself seems incredible, but true. So drawing back to this slide, the point being, and it's not just Taiwan, we see the same in the UAE now, we see the same in India and other states, that them taking on the philosophy of human rights at sea is what is going to better the supply chain, particularly when you look at seafood, seafood buying sector um, and asking those questions, is slavery and trafficking involved in our supply chain? I'm assuming you're still with me and I haven't broken the link, um, Julia. Yes, we're all still good. Thank you, David. Okay. Good. So I, I am getting through uh, the, the slides here. The, this slide's next slide on the government response just highlights a couple of points that they came back on. Um, we highlighted issues of accommodation, the life jackets, uh, incidents at sea um, and the salary deductions as well, where effectively workers have had to pay for the privilege of working and effectively putting their families themselves in a um, uh, servitude, uh, indentured uh, bondage as well. Um, and that is something, in, when we go back to that headline awareness point, within your individual supply chain, within your buying companies, you should have this in the back of your mind. Um, but also it's very clear that the government is taking a stand because of the awareness being highlighted internationally, not just within the, uh, the, the state. The other issues I wanted to highlight are fishery observer deaths. Now, um, when buying seafood, particularly, uh, and these are a lot is related to tuna industry at the moment, um, there are some real concerns about uh, the, uh, the, the, the support to fishery observers doing an independent role but the reality is that we are still getting a hold on the levels of abuse towards observers on board vessels, um, including murders, um, including abuse, being threatened to be thrown overboard. And again, all we would say is without diving deep into this subject, which is a, a webinar in itself, um, is that if you are aware that there are abuses within your supply chain and even murmurs or abuses, we would say, that it is up to you to take all necessary measures to investigate and indeed um, either report any instance that you become aware of, because often the reporting is a little bit of information that leads to the, um, the uncovering of abuse, um, but not to stay silent and certainly not to get involved with those supply chains or those, those parts of the supply chain if you are aware, reasonably aware that there are issues such as observer deaths. So, so that is our plea from ourselves on behalf of our colleagues who are fisheries observers. And the final um, slide, I believe, is uh, well, it's all well and good 
in a webinar saying this is what we believe this is what we've done how really how can we help you and as i said human rights see likes to give away its work um, we like to consider that we have a, a, a strong and high level standard of uh, of work uh, that we give away and the document that's on the screen now about implementing the un guiding principles was produced um, two years ago and is still totally in date but feel free as an example to download it and if you haven't got starting points so you just want to check where you are in terms of your management plan and the key questions to ask feel free to have a look at these and take some or or, or not at all but the point here is there is a tool and, and, and materials for you uh, to assist you so that uh, draws me to the close of my um, my piece in this webinar and uh, I look forward to any questions later on um, and, and many thanks for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Um, that frames the, the, the issues very, very well. And we can see that there's a wealth of resources available via the Human Rights at Sea website. Um, so thank you for pointing out to all that research and those resources. Uh, but before we go into any questions, I do have a question for you, but I'm going to pass straight to Darian for her presentation now who, to, to give us a perspective from the corporate side of how do you address uh, human rights human rights challenges down your seafood supply chains. So, so Darian, let me pass to you. Great, thank you, Julia and Jackie and David for that great presentation. Hi to everyone who's listening to this webinar today. I hope you're all safe and well in these unusual times and it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you. So today I'm going to speak to you from the perspective of Thai Union, and we are one of the largest seafood processors in the world, headquartered in Thailand, but we source less than 2% of our fish from Thai waters. So when people are speaking about these issues are all Thailand based, we take a very global approach. Our biggest market is the United States, our second largest market is Europe, so it really does encompass what's happening all over the world. Um, now, Julia, will you need to advance the slides for me? It looks like you have control. Try with your keyboard. There you go. Oh, yeah, okay, look, I've got so much control, I went crazy. Okay, so I'll talk to you a little bit about how we have addressed human rights um, at sea and on land. And it's within the framework of sea change, which is our sustainability strategy. But maybe I'll just, you know, reflecting on David's presentation, take you quickly back to when I joined Thai Union, which was in July, 2015. And I was mainly brought on board to create a global sustainability strategy, which is sea change. But the focus was on environmental sustainability, which is really interesting when you look back over not that many years. And so when David said that in 2013, it was the first time people started talking about human rights at sea, I can totally recognize that. And it was at the end of my first month with Thai Union, I remember I was in a, an airport, I think in the UK, heading back to Thailand, and I picked up a copy of the international version of the New York Times and there was Ian Urbina's article on sea slaves which referenced Thai Union in the article. So there was no chance to just stay looking at seafood sustainability. Human rights at sea became absolutely the number one topic that we as a company had to deal with. It was our most material issue. And there is no way of avoiding that topic when your company's name is Thai Union and you're headquartered in Thailand and you're one of the largest seafood processors in the world. Even if we weren't buying very much from Thai vessels, it absolutely was an issue that we had to face head on and in which we did. And I guess I'll just make a quick reference to the bottom of this slide. Um, you know, we've gone from really being nowhere in the sustainability world to we've been listed in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for six years in a row now. And for the last two, we've been number one in the world in the food products category, which I'm incredibly proud of. We're on the FTSE for good. And the World Benchmarking Alliance last year benchmarked the 30 largest seafood companies in the world. And Thai Union came at the top of that benchmark as well. So we really have progressed, but it wasn't by chance. It was through focus and determination. 
Okay, so briefly, sea change, and I'm giving you this background just so you can see how human rights fits within our overall approach. We've got these overarching objectives that the seas are sustainable for now and future generations, that our workers are safe, legally employed and empowered, and now we're starting to look at how combating climate change and promoting healthy diets through sustainable seafood is really of mutual benefit for everyone. So if we dig into that second point, which is that our workers are safe, legally employed and empowered, uh, you can see that we have these four pillars, which looks at all different aspects, but in particular, safe and legal labor. So that's the context that we're looking at. Are the people in our own operations and those in our supply chains employed safely and legally? And it seems a really basic question, but actually once you dig down into it, it's very complex. And again, at this point, I should point out Thai Union is a seafood processor. So we own factories on land. All of the vessels at sea are part of our supply chain. So that gives you even more of a challenge when, particularly if you look, say, at the shrimp supply chain, it's actually the seventh tier that you get to the vessels. So if you look at, we are processing shrimp that comes from a farm and the food has come from a feed mill and the fish caught by a Thai fishing vessel that was processed into fish meal and then sent to a feed mill before it went to the farm, before that shrimp came to Thai Union as processing. It really means that in some areas you need to go very deep. And I just point out along the bottom our operating principles and I'll come back to these because without those operating principles I don't think we could have come as far as we have done. So David also mentioned the sustainable development goals uh, out of the 17. I think they're all important, but for us, it was clearer to focus on the ones that made the most sense to us. So when we're talking about ending modern slavery, that's part of 8.7. So in goal eight, decent work and economic growth, and obviously a lot of work on life below water. So this is quite a complex outline when you have a look at it, but when you break it down, it, it does make sense. So looking at our human rights due diligence framework, and it does refer back to the UN guiding principles. So we have at the top level, our fundamental commitment to human rights, and then the assessment of the potential risks that you have within our own operations and our value chains and then prevention or minimizing those human rights violation risks, detection, so knowing what's actually happening in your operations and supply chains, and then access to remedy if you find where something has gone wrong, and then finally due diligence, disclosure, and transparency. And we put a big effort into transparency. I think the seafood industry wasn't particularly transparent. There hadn't been so much focus on it. And you know now you're starting to see a lot more people reporting, you're know, having transparency reports on seafood, uh, a lot more focus on human rights. And so this is important for driving change in the industry. So on that basic statement of policies and human rights, at Thai Union, you know, we've gone from your high level principles, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, plus the UN Global Compact, to our strategy, which is sea change to our targets within the safe and legal labor pillar, and then to our specific policies. And these have all developed at time. It's very nice to be able to present to you as, oh, here's the whole thing, but everything didn't come at once. But we do now have these four codes, which the policies, which really do guide our practices. So the next one is assessing risks. And this is really vital. Now, I don't consider auditing to be the be all and end all of ending human rights, but it's a good pulse check. If you don't understand what's happening in your own operations or your supply chains, then you can't possibly look at what are the aspects of remedy. So we identified our most salient human rights risks and which parts of the supply chain, and then we've conducted a lot of risk assessments. And I know Jackie mentioned earlier about the global standard for auditing at sea. One of the big things that we did in 2017 was introduce our vessel code of conduct and vessel improvement program. 
And certainly out of the companies that I'm aware of, we've probably conducted the most vessel audits for social compliance, um, both in international waters and we have a Thai program as well. The results actually come out very much the same. A lot of the key issues that David spoke about, um, about access to pay, being able to get home, understanding the workers' contracts, having correct safety and health procedures on vessels, lack of access to lifeboats, etc. And that's been a real revelation because once you have that information, then you can set about making sure that you can improve the situation. Pillar three is prevention. So we did things like in Thailand, uh, at the time, Thailand had not ratified the ILO's C-188. So working with Nestle, who are one of our largest customers, we renovated a Thai fishing vessel to demonstrate what meeting C-88 could look like. Uh, we started a, an ethical migrant recruitment policy back in 2016, and this was really based on the feedback from one of our NGO partners. And again, it seems unusual now, but we started doing this before any of the frameworks that exist now were actually in existence. This was because our NGO partner said to us, you don't realize it, but workers are coming to work in your factories in Thailand and have built up debts on the way to the factory. And even though you aren't charging those fees, you are responsible for your workers. Then a lot of supply education and training. Uh, this is a picture of a, a vessel owner who her crew came to some of our training that we did in Thailand and all of the representative vessels we developed with ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, medical kits and handed them out and gave basic training on CPR and first aid for those at sea. Um, we work with another NGO, the Migrant Workers' Rights Network, so that our employees in Thailand particularly the migrant employees, actually know what their rights are. Moving on to pillar four about detection. So I've spoken a bit about audits. We have a strong program of worker voice. Now, whether that is voice on land or at sea, there's different programs, but it is really important to be able to listen to and understand what the workers are saying. Was there a point, sorry, that someone was trying to raise? I'll continue. Okay, Darren. okay, so pillar five. Let's see. Can you see the slide advancing? It seems to, oh no, here we go. Let's move now. So remedy. So what do you do when you find something has gone wrong? So I do find businesses tend to think remedy is about paying back money if workers have paid money, particularly for recruitment. That is a part of it, but there's all different aspects of remedy from, you know, we've got here an example of helping victims of human trafficking, um, making sure people have the correct safety equipment to do their job, um, but then following up on what you find through your audits. Six, continuous monitoring and disclosure. So we've looked at all different aspects of our supply chain. So this is helpful if you're starting out. When we first started, we focused on our highest risk areas, which was our tuna supply chain and our shrimp supply chain. But then once we got through the shrimp and the fish, we started to look at chicken, which goes into some of our other products. We looked at logistics, we looked at packaging, we've looked at ingredients. So I think part of the importance of this continuous program is you don't need to do everything at once, but you do need to phase you know, what are the next steps? What is the next thing that you're going to do? And then going back to our three principles, good governance. So I am very fortunate that I report to the CEO. I'm on our global leadership team. I'm on our risk management committee. We have a sustainability committee and a safety, health and environment committee. And this isn't just to say I spend a lot of time on committee meetings, and I do, probably way too much time, but it is to say that sustainability and this work is integrated into how Thai Union operates. And I think that's one of the only ways that you really get to make change. 
Operating principle two is transparency. So we have a website, we publish our annual sustainability report in line with the GRI. We do specific updates on safe and legal labor. We do our transparency statements and much more extensive transparency statements than are required, for example, under the UK Modern Slavery Act. Um, a lot of public speaking, you know, I've spoken at the UN, I've spoken at the Bali process meetings, and that's all to really be transparent about what we're doing, where we came from, and the direction that we're heading. And then finally, partnerships and collaboration. We could not have done any of this if we didn't collaborate. I think these issues, whether it's environmental or social sustainability, are too big for any one company to do alone. And you need to recognize when other partners have more experience than you do. And so you can see some of the partners that we've worked with, um, International Labour Organization, International Transport Workers Federation, who are a union. And I think it's not very traditional for businesses to work closely with unions, but certainly for Human Rights at Sea, they've been one of our most valuable partners. Um, the Seafood Task Force is uh, industry collaboration. Greenpeace has really driven us to make changes that were necessary. So, you know, when the campaign against Thai Union started in 2015, behind closed doors, they would say, we know that you're not necessarily the worst, but you're the biggest and you're in the most countries and you've got brands in each country. And so that was in some ways hard to take. But at the same time, I do feel that we have made a lot of progress through listening to what our NGO partners have to say and working out solutions with them. And then finally, I've given you a lot of process and sort of documentation and how to work on all of this. But what I would say is it's actually not about the documents. It's not about having the correct policy on your shelf. It is about taking a worker centric approach. If you're doing something that has no impact on humans, whether it's humans at sea or humans on land, then probably you're not going to be effective. And that's sometimes important to remember in the business. It's people in our supply chains. It's people who are doing these dangerous jobs and sometimes unfair jobs. If you take a worker centric approach, I think you'll probably end up with a better outcome. That was it. Thank you, everyone. Excellent, Darian. Thank you very, very much. Um, and as, as you commented, Greenpeace said to you guys, you weren't certainly weren't the worst, but you were the biggest. And I think for, you know, it created an opportunity for the rest of us in the industry to learn from that case um, very, very well. And to be forewarned that we need to also get our houses in order in terms of policies, risk assessments, detection um, solutions, etc. Um, so that the same doesn't necessarily happen to, to us. Excellent presentation. Thank you to both. Um, I've got a burning question for both David and Darian, and I'm going to quickly ask those uh, and then we'll open up to any other questions, Julia, that might be in the chat box. Um, both uh, David and Darren, you, you commented on the International Labour Organization Work in Fishing Convention number 188. I think this is a key uh, document and regulation that people need to be aware about, key convention that, that people in the industry need to be aware about. Um, David, this question is for you. I know in Ian Avina's book, which you outlined, The Outdoor Ocean, uh, he brings to the fore very much so the concerns of flag states. Um, and one of the key challenges appears to be the fact that oversight of vessel operations very much lies in the hands of these flag states. So whichever state has flagged that vessel, that's where the responsibility lies. Um, and But often these um, the states vary in terms of capability and interest to properly monitor those, those vessels flying their flags. And in, in this situation, I know you've had many case studies of this in Taiwan, for example, Taiwanese-owned vessels that they flagged by Oman, um, and you've had incidences of missing seafarers, um, and so where does the responsibility lie, for example? What potential do you see in terms of conventions like the, the ILO, L -I -L -O Working Fishing Convention, number 188? 
um, which came into force in 2017. Do you see real potential here? You mentioned that only 18 countries out of 187 have actually ratified it. So, so are we starting to see impact from this convention? Thank you. Um, well, there's, there's two issues there. There's the first one is the flag state um, control um, in relation to what happens out at sea on those flagged vessels. Uh, and then secondly is obviously the, the 188. So if I deal with the flags issue, uh, flag issue before, again, um, people may not know this, but there's a 197, it might be 198 now, 100, well, I'll say 197 flag states in the world. Traditionally, they were the flags of the country that were used to protect the vessel. And traditionally, it was the navies or indeed later the coast guards of those states flying those flags on those merchant vessels that protect them around the world. Now, what we have is um, commercial entities and licensing authorities that effectively license those fl use of those flags uh, in many occasions. Um, and what you have under a thing called the Paris MOU is a list, the white, grey and black flag list. And that is uh, an assessment list which highlights who are the good, bad and ugly. Um, now, in amongst there, you also have national flags, but you have flags of convenience as well. And, and there have been a real push by the likes of the ITF Union to address um, how flags of convenience are used. And the nutshell is... Um, in many occasions, flags of a convenience are used simply because they are convenient and it allows you to then lawfully operate the vessel at sea, get your insurance, obtain cruise, uh, master, etc. in order to conduct business, but may not have the same level of due diligence as a non-FOC state. So with the background of that, just to explain it is that we tend to find that uh, the majority of the abuses that occur at sea, both with fisheries and seafarers, uh, as well as in relation to picking up the likes of migrants and refugees, uh, as we've seen in the Mediterranean, um, come from uh, flag states who, who maybe are not as credible as some of their contemporaries, if I put it that way. So uh, without having the flag uh, taking charge with a primary jurisdiction of its legislation being applied on board that vessel without them being credible, then the likes of 188, as you say, uh, 2007, effectively created and in, in place of the 16th of November of 2017, of those 187 states uh, within the ILO construct, um, only 18 have, have uh, signed and, and not all have ratified yet there's conditions involved with a, a number of those and, and the details on the ILO website but we talk about the potential and the impact well look it's a bit like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights um, you've got to start somewhere if we look at the comparison between 188 and the the seafarer commercial seafarer equivalent the maritime labor convention of 2006 the MLC has 96 um, ratifications um, but, but when we go back to 188, they're effectively short 169 ratifications. So there is definitely potential. But when we then come on to impact, the impact for us will only, there will only be impactful actions if ILO 188 is brought into the legislation of the state, either in whole or um, in part, um, as is the normal process. And then there is effective remedy because it's all well and good having legislation, it's all well and good having policies. And just to wrap up, if you don't have effective remedy, um, particularly in law, but of course big business has the ability to cancel contracts, without that effective remedy, it's toothless. So mm. if you combine that with flag states that maybe are not as credible as other flag states, a convention that needs a lot more signatories, there is potential but the impact can only occur if there's effective remedy within the state itself. I hope that makes sense. That does. Thank you, David. That makes complete sense. Um, and I do know that just um, home based here in South Africa, the government is working hard at bringing that into its own legislation here. And the industry is also working at how to apply it across vessels, both small and large. Um, so thanks very much for that very comprehensive answer on that. Darian, my question to you is really on 
the risk assessment. So your human rights due diligence framework um, actually reflects very nicely the recommendations coming from CFISH uh, in terms of have a basic statement, first of all, on human rights, a policy, then assess the risk, then put in place prevention, um, do some detection, as you mentioned, your worker um, work engagement uh, at factory level and remedy. In terms of the assessment, because I think honestly that's, okay, policies, fair enough, everyone needs to have a human rights policy in place. That's something that companies can do internally or get help with externally. But in terms of the risk assessment, that really seems to be a number one step um, and very much, I would say, applicable for our own membership, the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition, if they haven't managed to start this yet. But how far do they go? What, what would you say from your experience is realistic? You mentioned high risk species earlier, like shrimp and tuna. Would you, would you aim to apply this across the seafood supply chain or would you just start on one or two species, for example? So I guess it depends on the size of your business and how broad your supply chain or supply web is. And you need to look across that to see where your highest risks are. And for us, I think it was also a combination of materiality. You may know a particular species is high risk, maybe like a spiny lobster, but if everybody in the external world is extremely concerned about the shrimp you're sourcing from a country, then you still need to look at that as well. And I would say for those who are sourcing a number of different supply chains, you can't do everything at once or you can't do it all effectively at once because once you start assessing the risk, you actually want to take some actions for remedying or allaying those risks, mitigating the risks. And so I would suggest to say one or two highest risk categories to start with, to understand your process, to learn what you're going to do and to take some mitigating actions in those supply chains before you take on everything else. Because if you take a very broad approach to start with, you risk not really being effective in any area. Understood. Okay, that's very clear. Um, Julia, just want to pass yeah. over to you now to see, are there any questions coming up in the chat box? I see we're almost on the hour already. Yes. Uh, if people um, are happy to stay on for, for maybe five or 10 more minutes because this is such an important issue. Yes, um, I am conscious of the time. I have seen a few drop out because it's near, nearing the end of the hour. Um, there is a question that actually brings up me into the points from, from one of the follow-up questions and, 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 and getting involved at a later stage. So let me uh, just give a few actions on how to get involved um, in, in stages coming up. And I will ask that last question. So um, again, here is the link to the book that was brought up in, um, in David's presentation, The Ocean Outlaw. If there is anyone during this time of lockdown who might be interested in doing a little further reading. I just want to let everyone know on the call that we will have another uh, Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition webinar coming up. This will be in the first week of May and we'll be looking at traceability, transparency and disclosure. And please note that while we did extend the uh, invitation today to those who aren't currently members, typically our webinars are only for members. So please do get in touch if you're looking for um, membership and, and to start looking at your supply chain with some support from us. There are also some external webinars. I'm afraid both are tomorrow. So if, you're, if your calendar is already quite light, we have one from the EU's IUU coalition, um, as well as one from Elevate, uh, the organization that I work for, um, looking at sustaining the food supply. So if you're interested to join any of these, please get in touch and I can email you the registration links. Now, this is the last piece. And for those who are already jumping off, but I did notice that it, it did, um, there was a question in our chat box that is similar to this. And I think, you know, it's it's easy for us to think uh, we can do a webinar and, you know, we only talk about yeah, long term what we're looking at. But of course, we can't ignore that we're operating in a time of COVID. And there is a question that's come in um, just to wrap things up, some final thoughts from, from Darian, David and, and Jackie, if you have anything to add, because for us, we're looking at how the Seafood Coalition could perhaps, you know, what kind of platform can we look at in this context? The question that comes in is in this context of COVID-19, David and Darian, have you seen any increased 
risks um, do you think that workers may be further marginalized, especially those who are trapped in IUU fishing? So maybe I start with Darian to see if there's any comments um, on, on this very real issue we're facing today before going to David. Definitely. So we are seeing heightened risk for workers at sea, particularly those who cannot come into port, some who don't want to come into port. Um, they may not be able to for reasons of protecting their vessels. It may be that ports are closed. If they're sick for any reasons other than COVID, they may still need to seek medical attention. And so particularly working with ITF, we're looking at what we can do to help there. For the land-based facilities, so particularly processing factories, migrant workers are of course extremely vulnerable at the moment. Some have traveled home and yet there is no work when they're at home. They risk taking the virus with them when they travel to their hometowns. If they're remaining in their destination countries, they're also in a very vulnerable position. So I do see a lot of impacts and I think as a whole, and it's not just the seafood industry, we're trying to work through what we can do to support migrant workers, make sure that they are healthy and safe, that their accommodation and workplaces are safe and that they have employment where possible. Thank you. And David, any, any comments here from yourself? I, I, I would completely in, in, endorse what Darren's just said because we hear the same, uh, the two additional pieces uh, for us um, is, is is a lack of uh, access to uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, um, and the realities of whether or not that is going to assist individuals, but the, the choice of uh, individual workers to have access to it um, is something that is increasingly coming up. Um, and another piece that came out for us is increased social exclusion by families and communities of those workers and individuals returning home uh, because of coronavirus. Um, and that goes down to their um, understanding and awareness of the issue. Thank you both very much for that insight. Um, so let me thank you and, and I'll hand over to Jackie just for the final remarks of today's webinar. Thanks, Julia. Um, okay, so I'm assuming, Julia, just no further questions came through on the chat box, just to confirm for, for our speakers. Yes, I, I think it's already almost 10 past. I will wrap up now and we can connect uh, set offline for any further questions. Okay, absolutely fine. Um, so thanks very much to David and Darian for giving us your hour this morning, your expertise and insights into this very, very important topic. Um, thanks, Julia, for hosting the platform on Elevate um, platform. And I, I'm just very, very pleased we managed to organize this. Um, it is becoming uh, obviously a very burning issue for companies across the globe and something that the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition members are also aware of and need to um, start looking at down their seafood supply chains. So um, this, is, this is the start of the series of webinars that we have on human rights issues. We're certainly going to have another one later on in the year and we're going to start drilling down into some of the more uh, support tools uh, available uh, that companies can use. Uh, in assessing risk and putting in place remedies and solutions. So thank you to everyone for joining and please get in touch with either myself or Julia if there are any further comments or questions and we'd be very happy as well to mediate between the speakers um, if, if anything um, is, is needed.